Uh, welcome everybody to uh, this first of our uh, new series of inaugural lectures. I'm delighted to uh, be able to introduce Professor Richard Jispau, our Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, Research and Knowledge Exchange, to do uh, to present his inaugural. Um, inaugural lectures are a pivotal moment in the life of a professor, and they are here for the professor to profess their discipline, their study, their work, to engage us, because we may not all be experts in it, but at the end of it, I would hope we're both engaged, informed, and entertained. So I am delighted as well that this lecture is taking part in LGBTQ plus History Month, as we celebrate the LGBTQ plus community, both in our university and in society more generally. So I will get out of the way and have great pleasure in welcoming Professor Justin Powell. We'll see. So thank you very much indeed, Vice-Chancellor, for the, for the introduction. It's a great privilege, actually, to be here to present my inaugural. Um, it's also a great pleasure to be doing so during LGBT History Month. Now, I applied to be the Pro Vice-Chancellor of this university because of one of the values that really is very important to me, and that's the value around inclusivity. We are an institution deeply, deeply committed to inclusivity. So it really matters to me, actually, that this is taking place during this month. But on a personal level, it's very important because I am part of the community myself, so it has great personal relevance to me as well. So, and um, yes, so I'm, I'm just very pleased about this. And, I'll be presenting, actually, uh, a, a reflection, as the Vice-Chancellor said, upon the work that I've been involved in over the many um, years that I've been an, an academic professor. And also, just as a reminder, that in addition to my role as being Pro-Vice-Chancellor, I do actually do research myself, and uh, that's something I, I like to remind colleagues of as well periodically, and today, of course, is an opportunity for doing so. Just to, before I begin my lecture, I wish to, to say that I owe oh, my colleagues, my students, my collaborators, my research fellows, um, you know, uh, 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 much gratitude because without their input over the years, none of the work that I've, I'm about to outline would have been possible. So they've played such a pivotal role and um, they, they must be acknowledged. I'm, I'm not going to list people because I shall undoubtedly miss out some people, but I've worked with some incredibly talented people over the years who've inspired me and, and energized me. Uh, my undergraduate students, for example, and so I just wish to acknowledge their input. In terms of the lecture itself, I'm going to be talking about how identity is created, how it develops, and how it's defended, specifically among gay and bisexual men. That's the focus. But I'll, there are some specific things I want to cover. First of all, what is identity itself? It's a very fuzzy construct that isn't always understood or talked about in the same way by everybody. What can social psychology offer the study of identity? I'll then move on to examine a few self-identity issues that I've observed in my own research, specifically in this population. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the stresses, those events and situations that can cause psychological stress, and how gay and bisexual men may cope with those stresses, how they may attempt to restore a positive sense of self in the face of adversity. We psychologists are often accused of being very negative. And I think that's because we intervene when we face, when we, when we, we perceive problems. We intervene to try and propose solutions to those problems. So, so often we're talking about things when they go wrong. But I want to also talk about some of the protective factors, some of the things that can help people to cope effectively, a positive dimension to this debate. And ultimately, um, I, I'd like us to think about how health and well-being can be enhanced in this population. But the last point on this slide is a task for you as members of the audience, as, as attendees here. The question is, what does this research have to say for identity on the whole? And I'd like you to think about your own identities as I'm speaking, and to think about your own lives as well, because I think that's a good starting point for thinking about how some of the findings from this research may be transferable to other contexts, even if you yourselves don't identify as being part of this particular population. So over the years, I've um, examined a whole host of different topics from, for instance, um, the role of one's heritage language in determining one's identity, 
the uh, impact of a facial disfigurement upon a, one's sense of identity and well-being, climate change and how we can increase engagement with climate change mitigation. During the pandemic, looking at the um, relationship between being a musician and um, identity processes, and I felt like rather a charlatan when, when researching that, given that I can't play any instruments. But nevertheless, it, it was a fascinating project to be involved in. Um, I've done a bit of work in, on identity in the higher education context around diversity. So there's a whole host of topics I've researched, but the unifying thread across all of those topics is identity. And that's because I think identity is relevant to every aspect of human life. And I want to try and convince you of that um, during the course of my lecture. So what is identity? And, and crucially, I like to begin my lectures by, by um, convincing you um, as to why we should bother researching this in the first place. So the way I define identity is the constellation of elements that makes every individual unique and distinctive. By elements, I mean those group memberships that we have, being British, being South Asian, being a member of a particular sexual orientation group, any group, being a member of a particular organisation, these are group memberships. Personality traits, cognitive abilities, there are a whole range of elements that form part of an individual's identity. Now you may share some elements with others, but it's the unique configuration of elements that makes you unique. And I've, I've alluded to this, but identity has a content dimension therefore. And as you can imagine, I'd like you to reflect upon your own identities, your own group memberships, your own personality traits. There is, of course, a hierarchical structure that varies across time and space. Some elements become salient in some contexts and are attenuated in other contexts. As an example, I re I've always identified as being British, but I've never really thought about my national identity. The only time I really thought about it was when I lived in Spain for a year, then I felt very British. And um, when, when uh, British cuisine was criticised, something I habitually do myself, by the way, I felt rather offended by that. So, you know, your, your identities become salient in some contexts, but they're switched off in others. Now, I'll be talking about gay men of religious faith. And some gay men of religious faith face challenges because of those two identities, a the perception they're not compatible. Well, some report being in religious contexts and feeling more religious, but not gay, and being in LGBT spaces and the reverse happening. So our identities vary across time, space, wh whom we're speaking with. There's the value dimension. We append meaning and value to our identity elements. We decide whether they're good or bad, what they mean, and that will vary across time, space, events that occur around us. Now, a lot of people research identity as the end state. They look at what's happening with identity because it's fascinating. I find that fascinating. In fact, the book I'm writing at the moment is about identity change. However, I also like to look at identity as a predictor of something else. One's identity as shaping the way one thinks, feels and behaves. That is, I think, where the greatest utility in the study of identity lies, because it can enable us to predict how people will behave and think and feel in particular situations. And I'll talk more about that, particularly in the area of health promotion. Change is such a central part of what I'll be talking about because change is so inevitable. It's in, it invariably occurs. Now, human beings tend to resist change on the whole, but it is so inherent. Social change occurs. New parties may be elected and they change overnight, practically, the policy environment that we're operating with. Now, you can tell that I'm a senior university leader with what I'm saying. I'm thinking about that, of course, but in, in any sphere of life, but also um, nation states may be created. Uh, pandemics occur, as we've all observed ourselves. These things in the social environment are cause changes to our lives. But of course, we individually experience change. We grow older. We form new relationships. We discontinue some relationships. And um, we may be diagnosed with illnesses during the life course. These are individual changes which have consequences for our sense of self and our identity. They force us to rethink who we are in some cases. Now, let me just give you a few examples of that. I remember when September the 11th, uh, 
the, the attacks occurred. Um, and I remember how overnight, practically, people who hadn't thought of their Muslim identities being very salient suddenly began to think of that identity. They were categorized as such. They were excluded from spaces where they'd previously been included. I remember when the July 7th bombings happened, and the same thing happened in the UK and actually inspired me to do my PhD on that topic, looking at the well-being of marginalized communities in, in the face of an external event of that kind. So these events affect the way that we think, feel, and are categorized by others. And the basic premise of my work is to understand identity, you've got to look at how people react to change. And change is so readily available, it's happening around us, so we've got many case studies to examine. And that's what I've done quite opportunistically in my research, which is why I've done quite a few different topics. First things first, let me talk a little bit about my own identity. And I'm not going to talk about it for very long, so we'll skip this slide quite quickly. But I will just say that I was born in, in 1984 in Derby, in the Midlands, and lived there for the first 18 years of my life. And um, I had a very, very happy childhood, but I was very curious. And as my father will testify, who's sitting on the front row, my favorite question was why. So you probably knew I was going to become a researcher at some point. Nevertheless, there I am wearing hot pants in the early, um, in the early 90s. Um, and, um, and, but I remember at that age actually being extremely curious about difference. And I was very conscious of my own difference, of my own minority identities. I was aware of my minority identity in terms of ethnicity, in terms of my religious background, in terms of my sexual orientation. All of these identity characteristics made me feel different. And I guess you, you take a stance on that and you think, what am I gonna do with that? My, I had a curiosity to, to learn, to discover more about um, what it means to be a minority, what it means to have so many minority and marginalized identities as part of your um, overall identity structure. So it inspired me greatly. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I had my life planned out at that age, that I knew I was going to be a researcher. But that's really, I was so curious and I was very ambitious to discover more at that age. And so I went to the University of Cambridge and there I am with my parents and my um, little sister, who's not very little anymore. Um, and uh, I, I, during that, that period when I was at Cambridge, I um, discovered that I wanted to become a psychologist. And it happened rather by accident. I remember going into the university library because it was raining or something like that and just thought, I'll have a look around the psychology section and finding a book that was to change the course of my career. It was called Coping with Threatened Identities and it was written in 1986 um, by Glennis Breakwell. I read it and I thought, this is a book that really resonates. It makes sense to me. It's, it's not proposing solutions. It's actually outlining questions that we desperately need to answer as a community of researchers. And so I went on to do an MSc and a, and a PhD in psychology, focusing on that theory, looking at the topic I just mentioned, at how ethnic minorities construct a sense of Britishness and the implications for their well-being. And there I am on the bottom slide, um, giving my first of, this is my fourth inaugural, by the way. That was my first inaugural back in 2015, when I was appointed um, professor of um, psychology and sexual health. Um, looking really at the, the mechanisms of identity. Right, now we've got my identity out, out of the way, but you'll see how um, that, that sort of is, that my own identity is, is observable in the, the work that I've done. And I, I passionately believe that as researchers, we do, we research particular topics because it has personal relevance in one way or another. Certainly for social science researchers, many of the topics I've researched have affected me in one way or another or been relevant to me. Right. Moving swiftly on, I'd like to say a few words about the social context of the population I'll be talking about and just pick out a few key events because what I've said is that events around us shape our identities. They shape the way we think, feel and behave. And here are a few milestones relevant to the community I'm talking about. The decriminalization of homosexuality in 1967. It always feels astonishing when I say that because it's just so recent. There are so many people who remember that era, so many people who remember coming of age before decriminalization or in the immediate aftermath. And remember, social attitudes don't always change um, as soon as laws change. They take time. And, and I think coming of age and, and coming out at that time would have been remarkably different from doing so in, to, in, in this day and age. And in fact, I think this is constantly evolving. But after that, a great deal of positive events occurred, like 
activism, like the removal of homosexuality from the register of psychiatric illnesses, a major step forward given that it was previously categorized as being a mental illness, which was to shape the way in which people regarded and um, engaged with people who identified as being LGBT. But something happened in the early 1980s, and that was the first clinical observations of AIDS, which wasn't always called AIDS. It was metaphorically referred to as the gay plague in the early days. And um, there was not only was there great devastation and trauma to this community in particular, many others, but in Western industrialized societies, this was a disproportionately affected community. But with AIDS came a great deal of stigma. And whilst we have made tremendous medical advances in the treatment of AIDS, of HIV, which means that many people do not go on to develop advanced HIV infection, the stigma persists. And much of that stigma is associated with homophobia, homonegativity, which I'll be talking about. And I think actually events like this massive one around HIV AIDS was to then herald the promulgation of legislation which almost took us back to square one, like section 28 in, um, of the Local Authority Act in 1988. 1988. Now, to talk about my own personal identity, I was at school then, and when it was repealed in 2003, I was 18 years old. So I, my entire socialization was in silence. We didn't talk about LGBT identities. There was a silence around that. And that itself had a profound impact, I believe, on a generation of LGBT people, because silence means stigma. It reinforces the negative beliefs. What we need to do is to actively counteract them. That didn't happen at school. And um, I, when I speak with my much younger sister about what it's like to be at school, um, or what it was like to be at school in the aftermath of that, we have very interesting conversations, and certainly because people felt much more open um, than they did, certainly during the time that I was at school. And then much very positive legislation as well occurred. Um, but what's, what we must bear in mind is that there is a, um, a considerable gap between promulgation of the uh, Civil Partnership Act and marriage. Um, and, and that also was to have an, an impact on many people who didn't want a civil partnership but wanted to be married but didn't have the right to do so here. Now, against that backdrop, we should consider what I'm, what I'm going to say subsequently um, from now on. Gay and bisexual men are also more likely to experience a whole host of adversity, adverse um, experiences. I'm going to focus on, on health largely, but we can see on a whole range of fronts. Stigma, prejudice, discrimination um, is more prevalent, of course, on the basis of sexuality than um, uh, uh, as is experienced by the general population. Trauma during childhood, such as sexual abuse experiences, bullying experiences associated with one's sexuality. Intimate partner violence. We see a greater incidence of substance misuse, which itself is related to poor sexual health outcomes, something I've dedicated my career to researching. And indeed, I just wanted to say it's been a great privilege on that note to, to look at this um, in collaboration with the Terence Higgins Trust, where I've been um, on the advisory board for many years, and I'm delighted that colleagues from the Terence Higgins Trust are also joining um, us today. Um, but but you know, we do this work because we know there is a challenge, particularly in this population, around sexual health and HIV. Self-harm and suicidal ideation. And then particular issues that may not be as... Uh, as um, as commonly discussed, like erectile dysfunction that doesn't have physiological causes but rather psychological antecedents is more observable and more prevalent among gay and bisexual men, which may have a lot to do with the sort of trauma and the self-esteem issues which I will be talking about, sleep problems as well. So there's a whole host of inequalities. Now this may seem like the job of a physician or a medical researcher. And of course, I have tremendous respect for my colleagues in the medical um, area, and I've collaborated with them throughout my entire career. But I do feel we psychologists have a role to play as well, and that's what I'll be talking about today, the role that we have to play in this as well. So I want to outline a few social psychological theories. I'm mindful of the limited time I have, so I'll try not to go overboard on this, although I could. I'm, I'm, I've been described as a theory person, um, and I get people to help me with, with statistics. But... But theory is important, it's important, and that's going to help us to answer the last, last question, because theory is transferable across contexts. So let's, let's focus on the theory as well. The first one is social representations theory. 
How do we come to understand things that we don't really know about? Novelty, how do we come to understand novelty? Well, the theory is all about how the unknown becomes known, how it becomes commonsensical to us. And we do that through two basic processes. We link new things that we don't really know about, like AIDS, when that first was talked about. No one knew about that. Like COVID, no one knew about that either. But it was linked to things that we already knew about, and that's, that forms a template in people's minds. Objectification refers to the use of metaphors. Very commonplace in our language. In fact, if you were to count the metaphors you use in a day, you'd probably be surprised. You know, like I'm starving, for example. You're not really starving, are you? It's a met so there's lots and lots of different words of that kind that we use that shape the way we then come to understand the phenomenon under discussion. Now, for many heterosexual people who perhaps uh, haven't engaged or don't know that they've engaged with people who are LGBT, they are also reliant upon social representations to, when, when they first hear about this or when they, engage, when they engage with people from that community. So social representations are important. But crucially, people, when they're constructing their own identities, will draw upon these representations that are operating within their environment. The ideas, the images, the assumptions, and that will inform the way they construct their own identity. That's why it's quite important, but I will, will return to this. And I've used the theory in a, in a range of different areas. This is just a few papers that I've written about, for instance, HIV stigma in the press and how that invariably involves diatribes against gay men and bisexual men and, and the way in, in their, their lifestyles. Um, and so we see that even when particular health problems are being discussed, there, um, an opportunity is not missed by the press in many, regard, in many um, op, uh, uh, instances to also uh, fuel stigma that, that exists. This is an important theory in the area that I work in. That's minority stress theory. It is about how adverse social situations relating to one's minority status can lead to stress. And that can accumulate over time. It can harm health outcomes, and it describes those processes. And it identifies two types of stressor. There's one type of stressor, which is a distal stressor. They're things that happen outside of the individual's own psychological operation. Discrimination, for example, that happens to you. Prejudice, stigma, other people doing something to you. They're stressors that are distal. But there are some whose effects, I would argue, are more insidious that are proximal stresses. They are the ones in the individual's mind, such as internalized homophobia. You can resist homophobia in some cases, but when you internalize that homophobia, when you uncritically accept it, and you experience self-disgust, and in some cases self-hatred, that is very traumatic for one's well-being, and it can, in, can, it can affect an individual's, um, the way the, the individual operates. So it's, as you can imagine, these stresses have to varying extents been linked to mental health, poor mental health outcomes, and poor sexual health outcomes. But the curious um, researcher in me um, asked the question, well, why is it that some people are affected by, by, by distal stresses, why others are not? Why is it that some people are able to resist some stresses whilst others are not? What are the, what's the explanation for that? Well, I come back to identity process theory. I see that I have a few of my PhD students here, and I know what you're thinking. Rusi can't possibly give a lecture without mentioning identity process theory. And you're right. But anyway, I'm gonna now make a case for identity process theory and why I think this is so relevant and so important in, in, in the study um, of uh, gay and bisexual male identity construction. This is a generic theory that was developed never it was never intended to examine gay and bisexual men in particular. It was a generic theory of how we all construct our identities. It argues that there are two universal human processes. We assimilate and accommodate novelty into our identity. We, new things happen to us. A student goes from being an A-level student to going to university. That is a change. And they have to assimilate and accommodate being a university student. And we talk about that at the university executive board all the time, how we can facilitate that process. So we're aware of that happening. We're aware of the challenges that our first year students can experience. An individual who's coming out as gay has to, first of all, do so at an individual level and then decide whether or not they want to disclose that and share that with other people. So this is a process that constantly happens. Think about acquiring a new job. You know, it's not specific to minority groups. 
We make room for that new identity element when it comes into identity. The gay man who's of religious faith, when he, um, and I'm using the pronoun he because I'm referring to men, but I should say they, when they, when they decide to come out, they may rethink other elements of their identity. Do I really want to be a member of this religious group? Perhaps I should leave that religious group because it's not very accommodating of my gay identity. So we accommodate that identity. That's why identity is constantly in shift. The hierarchical structure changes, as I mentioned. But we also evaluate. We append meaning to these elements. We decide whether it's good or bad. And that changes over time. Now, I gave you the example of how um, there was a, a sense of internalized Islamophobia, actually, in some Muslims after the, the um, September 11th attacks because they felt stigmatized. And so many felt that they must hide their identity. They couldn't share that with anybody because they felt that they would be on the receiving end of stigma if they did so. So these things change over time space in accordance with social representations. But of course, we don't just do that in a random fashion. We do that to produce what we call desirable end states for identity. Now, it will come as no shock to you that we seek feelings of self-esteem. We seek feelings of control, competence. In the face of change, we try and retain a consistent narrative that connects past, present, and future. We try to be distinctive, but not too distinctive, because we don't want to be excluded. And that distinctiveness has to be positive. So it's nice to stand out in a good way, but not in a bad way. So we seek these principles. The theory argues when those principles are somehow curtailed, it could be one of them, it could be all of them, identity is threatened. And the individual will, re will react to that. We, we're resourceful. We don't just sit around doing nothing. We react to that by coping. And coping operates at at least three levels. We have some strategies that are psychological. We may deny things. If you deny that something's happening, it, ca it cannot gain access to consciousness, and it protects you. People may deny that they're gay. Their, people around them may deny that they're gay as well. And that is a common reaction that we see in people who face non-affirmative responses. People may reconceptualize what the threat really means. They may re re rename it, give it a new name. And that can help them. For instance, the research I've done around HIV, what we see is that because of the stigma, many people initially see the HIV infection as the end of the world. But they may eventually come to reconstrue that as that was, a, that was a, um, a turning point for me. It made me rethink my priorities. It made me value my life. It made me encounter new people. And so they give it a positive um, reconstrual, which can help to promote a positive sense of self. So these are strategies for coping. At an interpersonal level, we may decide to conceal our identity, and pass ourselves off as being a member of a group that we're not really a member of. And I've seen that in my research a lot where people may, may initially um, claim to be heterosexual when they know that they're not, so as to avoid the stigma, for instance. Or they may isolate themselves to avoid threat. If you isolate yourself, you can't be threatened because no one's there to threaten you. They may, but of course, as you can imagine, these are short-term coping strategies because social support is a known effective strategy if you isolate yourself. You cannot derive social support. And then finally, there are some group-based strategies. We may form pressure groups. We may get involved in activism. We may decide to depart groups. Our groups are so relevant to the ways in which we cope. Now, some of these strategies operate across boundaries, and so we've developed some coping styles to understand how this happens. An example of that is if you're denying something, you might also simultaneously self-isolate because they go together quite well, the, the former really um, supporting the latter. And it's often the case that people around you don't let sleeping dogs lie. So you, it makes it difficult for you to deny something you want to deny if you associate with people. So coping is something we all do. I'd like you to reflect on ways in which you may have coped when you felt threatened, something that's a habitual human experience. Now, why do some people, why do they differ in their extent of threat? And how do they cope? Why do they differ in the way in which they cope? I think there are at least four things. There are many more, and my, my students are busily researching uh, other, other things that determine the extent of threat and coping. But I want to just mention a few of them. Personality is key. A person who values conservation, for instance, or tradition, will be more threatened by a hazard to their, their continuity. 
than someone who really endorses change and values transcendence, for instance. A person who's, who ha who's more neurotic may be more um, at risk of threat than somebody who is not. Identity resilience is a construct we've developed, and that refers to the individual's baseline levels of self-esteem, continuity, self-efficacy, and distinctiveness. Now, you can ask people to reflect upon their lives and to rate the extent to which they feel those four things, not in response to a particular thing that's happened, but based upon their life. Now, I started my talk by saying that I had a very happy childhood in Derby. That's going to contribute to the amount of identity resilience that I have. If one didn't have a happy childhood, the answer to that question might be slightly different. Your relationship status, having a, a relationship that's a happy relationship will contribute to that. So all sorts of things in our lives contribute to our level of identity resilience. Now what we found is the higher your baseline level of identity resilience, the more able you are to withstand a hazard that might cause somebody else with lower resilience a threat to identity. It enables people to elect risky but effective coping strategies. Now, sharing a problem with someone else is risky. It's risky because they may not give you the response you're hoping for. But you, you're more likely to do that if you've got resilience. You're more likely to take a gamble and share your problem with a view to seeking a solution to it. So resilience is key. Having social support available. And also, I'd argue, the nature of the threat itself. And this is one that's really hard to research. So it's a hypothesis. Is it the case that when a threat is existed for so long, it stops, it loses its power to threaten? People take for granted that that's what happens to people like me. And I've seen that in cases of the Indian caste system, where there is horrendous prejudice that is faced by many people who uncritically accept the system because it's always been there. It's the way my, my forefathers lived and it's the way I am destined to live as well. So I believe over a period of time, some people derive strategies and they almost, they, it's not a particularly nice experience, but the threat, the threat wanes over time. Now I'm going to talk a bit about the stresses and their um, co the, uh, stresses in, that I've observed among gay and bisexual men, focusing on a few of them. Now there are many that I could talk about, but just a few that I've observed in my research. And the first one is around traumatic experiences in childhood, and I'll be linking that to identity. Now what we found is that there is an association between the experience of uh, adverse experiences in childhood and poor identity, relationship, and mental and sexual health outcomes in later adulthood. And I've done research in a number of areas, as I mentioned, and I'll be picking from various different studies that I've done. And I try, and I say this to my students as well, as they will note, I try not to rely exclusively on research conducted in Western industrialized societies, but also research conducted in the global south and elsewhere. I think one of the things that really um, is a dilemma for me is that we psychologists do call ourselves scientists, and I would as well. We like numbers, we do statistics, um, but we have a lot in common with our colleagues in sociology, but many of us like to differentiate ourselves by calling us ourselves scientists and claiming to be very objective and also um, claiming that our theories apply to all human beings and not really paying very much attention to culture. Hopefully you'll have noted I'm not part of that camp, but um, it's important to note that. Culture's so key, so we need to be drawing upon research conducted in these other areas as well. So that's why I wanted to talk about a study of Colombian gay men living in London who are living with HIV. We are talking about multiple identities after all. If you look at these extracts, you'll see what I'm saying about the link between adversity and identity in adulthood. Fernando said, my childhood was the worst time in my life because I was abused, you know, and I always wonder if this was the reason I turned out gay. When I felt sexual attraction, it felt dirty. This is a classic example of internalized homophobia that can arise on the basis of childhood experiences because one can make an, a mental association between that childhood experience and a stigmatized identity element. Because we as human beings try and make sense of things, and that's a readily accessible explanation which enables one to still continue to, to identify with one's culture, but also have an explanation for why one might be gay. And it's not a particularly favorable context for one's identity. It's not a positive situation to be in, in terms of one's identity. 
And I said I talk about sexual risk, and you can see in the other extract that some of this, um, the, the, the identity issues are related to the type of sexual behaviours that some people might engage in, the desire for anonymity during sexual encounters, and fear of disclosing their identity and not thinking about um, ways of reducing their risk of exposure to sexually transmitted infections, um, HIV, and so on. Now, I want to just present some of my quantitative data very quickly, and I'm not going to go into lots of detail about the model um, and certainly not about the statistics. But with this particular uh, study, which was a study an, of an ethnically diverse sample of gay and bisexual men in the UK, I'm told one of the first, but I don't want to claim that, but I'm told it was one of the first to have um, a sample of uh, people who are of Hispanic background, um, South Asian background and uh, black uh, British background uh, with a white British, white, compar uh, white British comparator group. And what we found here, and this is really this relationship over here, is that there is an indirect relationship between uh, sexual abuse and sexual risk through the frequency of, of um, substance use. And so what we find is that sexual abuse is related to people, uh, an increased um, likelihood of a person using substances, which in turn is positively associated with engagement in sexual risk behaviours. And the way in which that can be explained on the basis of other research is, is that some people may use um, substances as an escapist behaviour, to escape. It's a self-soothing um, behaviour, which of course can have consequences for other um, dimensions of health. And there are other observations as well which are quite controversial, and that is that there's a relationship with the frequency of racism and homophobia. And there are many theories that have been used, that have been presented to explain that, that when an individual faces victimization, they may, um, they may actually find themselves in situations where they are re-victimized because, for instance, they may not call out those behaviors, they may not feel they have the confidence to do so, it may become normalized for them, and therefore they may experience them on a, on a greater, uh, to a greater extent. So it shows the gravity of childhood experiences that can, can be insidious and continue to affect one in adulthood. I'd like to say a few words also about minority stress, identity threat, and mental health now. And just coming back to homophobia, which is the synonym is homonegativity, because actually phobia is the Greek for fear, and we're not just talking about fear here, we're talking about negativity, talking about stigma, we're talking about discrimination. We know that homonegativity can affect gay and bisexual men in a multitude of ways. Their ability to operate effectively within the workplace, especially when this is encountered within the workplace. Now, um, I, I often talk to my uh, f friends and others who, are, who don't work in academia, and I think working in academia is um, wonderful because we do tend to really value inclusivity and we do tend to value difference and we do tend to think about these things in a slightly different way from some other areas wh which may be uh, dominated by particular groups and uh, other groups may be invisible. So the experience is variable across different sectors. I mean, some of my friends say I've never really been in the real world. I think what they mean by that is that I've always had a career in academia where things are different, but one has to be aware of what it's like, for example, to be gay or bisexual in a, com in, in a completely different area area, what it's like also to be a, a, a man in a, um, a, with gender atypical employment or, for, or to be a woman in gender atypical employment or to be non-binary um, uh, in, in, in many different spheres. So that's really important for us to be aware of. It can also affect a person's, the nature of their, uh, the quality of their health care that they get, particularly if they face adverse experience in, within clinical settings, and that's a really important point. As I'll show, mental health um, can be affected, poor coping skills as a result of exposure to homophobia. An interesting one is also the ability to m maintain um, relationships, romantic relationships, because of the uh, desire to conceal one's relationship from others if one feels that one may face discrimination or prejudice on the basis of one's sexuality. And that can become challenging, particularly if one's romantic partner is not uh, as affected as one is by those experiences of discrimination. And of course, uh, needless to say, it can limit one's, the, the extent to which one has social support because if you anticipate discrimination, you're less likely to share your identity with others and thereby to derive support. Now, what I want to just say is to provide a response to anybody who thinks, of course, nobody in this room would think this, but anybody who thinks who's watching the recording afterwards, that homonegativity is not a problem in 21st century Britain. That all the attitudinal surveys show that 
attitudes are improving. Well, actually, as a quantitative researcher, you only get out of your survey what you put into it. So it's the survey, the questions you ask will determine the answers you get. If your instruments aren't sensitive enough to pick up subtle forms of homophobia, like microaggressions, for instance, oh, I didn't know that you're gay, you don't look very gay, with the, the sort of subtext there being um, looking heterosexual is really the desirable thing to, to do, um, but, but, but you do, you do look heterosexual. You know, those sorts of microaggressions which are difficult to challenge because if you tell that to somebody else, they may say, well, it's not really homophobia, but it's experienced as such. I mean, today we were having a conversation about equality, diversity and, in, um, and inclusion, and we noted how uh, many people in, um, in uh, 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 sort of uh, current generation um, use the term that's so gay when referring to something negative. Again, a microaggression, because what's being said there, although people may not, may, may not be cognizant of this, is that actually there's something bad and I'm describing that as gay. So this is more subtle forms of, of homonegativity which do exist. So we've got to make sure as researchers we continue to refine our instruments so we capture the problem and we don't just shelve it as something that's, that's an issue of the past because that's what some policymakers sadly think. Now I want to just come back to the effects in adulthood of some of the things I've talked about. Some people say, well, you come out, you face a negative experience, you face lots of positive ones, get on with your life. But, so we decided to actually look at the insidious effects of experiencing a negative coming out experience to show how crucial that milestone is for many people and how we have a duty as a society to support minorities of any kind when they share their identities that are marginalised, including gay and bisexual and other LGBTQ plus people. So we did an experiment. I do like a good experiment because we can then talk about causality. We cannot on the basis of cross-sectional data although some people do frame their conclusion sections as such, but one must be very careful about that. So we did an experiment with 333 gay men in the UK to look at how gay men would respond to recalling a single negative coming out experience to somebody who mattered, the somebody who mattered bit's important, versus somebody who reported a neutral experience. Not necessarily positive, just neutral. Nothing negative happened. So let me just reiterate what I've just said. Our participants were randomly assigned to one of the two conditions. They were asked to describe this experience and to think about it whilst completing a whole host of measures. And there was a focus on stresses, which I've already explained, like discrimination and so on, and some possible protective factors, as well as mental health outcomes. That's the model. Now, I, I realize the screen is rather small, and some of you are sitting further away, and I can barely see it from where I'm standing. So I'll just highlight some of the key points but I'm happy to make my slides available to anybody who's interested, or indeed the paper. Now, what we found was those in the negative recall condition, those who were asked to recall a negative experience of coming out to someone who mattered, reported more identity threat. Remember, that's lower self-esteem, continuity, self-efficacy, and distinctiveness. That's significantly, statistically significant. However, we find that baseline identity resilience buffers the distress that people experience when recalling that, ex that, that coming out experience. What I mean by that is those who are asked to recall the experience, who have higher baseline resilience, don't experience as much distress. Clue number one for, I did say something about practical implications. Clue number one, let's support people to build greater identity resilience to cope with adversity, not just in this context, in any adverse, adverse situation. Little footnote there. I do remember a question I was asked when I was interviewed for my position, and that was, Rusi, what's your leadership style like? And it's a tricky question to answer. But one of the things, the answer I would really like to have given was identity resilience. How do you build that in your team? How do you ensure that people around you are empowered to feel that they are also making the contribution that they can make? So it's, it's, it, it functions across a whole range of contexts, not just this one. I want us to think very carefully about the value of resilience. And internalised homonegativity, which is also a baseline characteristic, is associated with greater distress. So if a person has the internalised homonegativity, then they face that, that negative experience, they will face greater distress. 
Clue number two, we need to challenge, support people around internalised homonegativity. We need to ensure our psychotherapeutic approaches are also attuned to that, that they are gay. I'm looking at my colleague Claire, who is a psychotherapist. Um, to, to, who, so they are attuned to deal with those and people feel able to share with their therapist um, experiences that they may not ordinarily share due to stigma. And another study, which is, I just want to show the effects in general. This is a, an interesting one, and it's on conspiracy theorizing. Now, I, I said I've, I've had my fingers in many pies, and that's because of the talent, talented person I worked with, Daniel Jolie, who's interested, uh, I was about to say obsessed there, but in a good way. He's one of the, the, the country's leading figures in conspiracy theories, just like I'm obsessed with identity process theory. We joined forces, we looked at conspiracy theorizing, which as we know, can have really insidious effects on the way in which people believe, uh, behave. Now we looked at um, the uh, identities of 244 white British um, gay men, and I, I'll, I'll mention why the ethnicity component is important in a moment. And we looked at their sexual health screening and their acceptability of pre-exposure prophylaxis for preventing HIV infection. So one of the major contributions to reduced HIV incidence is not only the advent of antiretroviral therapy, which reduces an individual's viral load, meaning they're less infectious, but also the advent of pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is a um, uh, 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 antiretroviral um, drugs which can be taken either on an intermittent basis or daily to prevent um, HIV infection. These two phenomenon things have had a tremendous impact on HIV incidents in this country and elsewhere in um, the world. So we wanted to look at, well, it exists. Will gay men accept it? Will, they, will those who are at risk use it? But we wanted to include conspiracy theorizing and we wanted to include variables such as discrimination because we believed that they had a, have a role to play. Now, without going into too much detail about the models, because they're a complex serial mediation models, suffice to say that what we found was, in, in the model at the top, that, a that an experience of negative contact with a healthcare practitioner, in other words, discrimination, homonegativity, is positively correlated with the endorsement of HIV conspiracy beliefs. So those who go into the clinic and face discrimination are more likely to reject the official line and to seek clarity, meaning reduce uncertainty by endorsing conspiracy theories. They then are less likely to believe that PrEP is a good thing. Outside of clinical settings, we also found that hypervigilance, which is the anticipation of discrimination, something minorities face, if you face discrimination, you're going to anticipate it. Even if it's, even if it's in an innocuous situation, you may well be primed to think you will face discrimination. That is associated with reporting discrimination. It may not exist, by the way, which in turn is related to the conspiracy theorizing, which is then related to negative attitudes. So it shows, I'm just showing you the plethora of ways in which a challenge to your identity shapes the way you think, feel, and behave, which is what I said identity should be related to. Now, let me move on. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to quite swiftly move through this very important section around negative self-image in gay and bisexual men. And I think I've explained what I mean by internalized homonegativity already, but because I want to explain some of the predictors of that, it's such an important variable, I, I thought I'd just remind us of it, uh, of it being um, about the inability to construct a positive and healthy sense of identity and its relationship with a whole host of different negative sequelae, like the ones that I've actually just already outlined, but also sexual risk-taking, relationship dysfunction, and anti antagonistic family relations. We want to look at the factors involved in predicting internalized homonegativity in a sample of gay and bisexual men, and this is cross-sectional. So we don't really know causality. I did say that at the beginning. So I must confess, this is cross-sectional. So it's, it's what it's related to. But we can deduce on the basis of previous research what the causal direction is likely to be. But we must be clear, this is not causal. We need experimental work for that. What we find is that when people feel upset when, upon recalling a negative coming out experience, they're more likely to report uh, internalized homo homonegativity. That comes back to the point I made earlier, which is that some people are able to withstand discrimination whilst others are less likely to do so. That can generate internalized homonegativity. Discrimination. 
Interestingly, the two protective factors are outness. Now, some people argued when I was presenting this research elsewhere, well, the more out you are, the more discrimination you are likely to face. Very plausible hypothesis. But I would also argue that the more out you are, the more likely you are to acquire social support. You have to be out to some extent, at least to some others, to be able to derive support from them. And of course, if you measure outness in the right way, outness is not just about you telling someone that you're gay or bisexual. It's about the number of people you've told. It's about the extent to which you subsequently discuss that part of your identity. There are some people who come out to their parents once and it's never discussed again. One's partner becomes one's best mate. Um, you know, it's brushed under the carpet. You see what I mean by that? So we must not treat outness as a dichotomous yes or no variable, rather as a continuum. It, we vary in the extent to which we are out. And the more out you are, the less internalized homophobia you have. Because actually it makes sense. You are more likely to come out to people from whom you anticipate a positive response. You are more likely to share your identity with people who will reinforce the positive aspects of your identity. So it's a type of coping response in a way if you think back to identity process theory. And needless to say, identity resilience is also inversely related to internalized homophobia because it gives people the resilience to, re to reject that negative self-hatred type of self-schema. But I did say it's vitally important that we look beyond the UK context and industrialized, Western industrialized societies. Now, again, one of my magnificent students, Ismail Matouk, who's a Lebanese physician who's doing, I've managed to persuade him to use identity process theory in his research. He's a dermatologist, um, but he's, I think, thriving. And I'm sure he'll introduce that into dermatology in some shape or form. Um, but he is looking, he's looking at internalized homonegativity. And uh, we did a study in Lebanon, very uh, challenging to get data in some contexts like Lebanon because it's not a context which is particularly um, celebratory of LGBT identities and it can be challenging, but he did it. And he did it because, he's all, because dermatology also includes sexual health and many of his patients happened to be gay and bisexual men. So I think he had rather privileged access to a sample. Um, but what we found in the research was that the predictors were rather interesting. So religiosity is related to higher internalized homonegativity, but it's also associated with higher well-being. Why might that be? Because actually it's such a central part of Lebanese culture. You belong to a religious group, that's your main, it's in, intrinsically entwined with your national identity. Yet if you think about identity as multifaceted, as I pleaded with you, we must do, when one's identity, sexual identity is salient, it can actually cause internalized homonegativity. Bisexuals appear to be uh, more prone to internalized homonegativity. Family pressure to have a heterosexual marriage is also, and of course the centrality of the family unit would mean that this makes gr a great deal of sense. And whilst outness is inversely related to internalized homonegativity in our UK study, it is positively associated to internalized homonegativity in Lebanon. So it, it says, it speaks volumes about social representations, which I mentioned at the beginning. It depends on the context that you're in and the ideas that are dominant and circulating within that context. And it comes back to my example of working in universities. I don't think anybody's really ever been any doubt, in any doubt about my identity because it's always been a safe space in which to share that identity. But I dread to think what it would be like in some other contexts where people have to conceal who they are. I want to just present a little bit of qualitative data as well, because I don't want you to leave with the impression that I just deal with numbers. All methods are vitally important. And these vividly bring to life some of the research that I've done in, actually some of my early research, that paper is from 2010, into the experiences of gay Muslims in the UK. And at the time when I was researching this area, it, I was researching it again because I had identity at the forefront and I thought, let me look at two identities that are really in conflict. And let me look at what people are doing to cope. And what can we learn from that to support not only them, but to think about how we support the reconciliation of potentially incompatible identities. And what we, as you can see from the extracts here, in this qualitative study of just 12 British Muslim gay men in the UK, 
are some of the reasons why people may be experiencing internalized homonegativity. There is an assault on their sense of self-esteem, continuity, their sense of coherence between these identities. Ahmed says, in our community, being gay is seen as something sick, unnatural, unholy. So knowing that I'm gay always made me like, it made me hate myself sometimes, thinking I had no right to do it. And if you look at Mohsen's um, extract at the bottom, being gay goes against Islam completely, I know, but I try to resist it. Right now I'm going against God. It's so important that we bear in mind, again, coming back to this notion that homophobia is waning, there are some groups within our diverse society who do not have the privileged access to safe spaces which I've described in relation to my own identity. They simply don't have it, and we must acknowledge this. We're only telling part of the story if we do not. And I did one of the studies, I was, I was talking to my, uh, my research intern today and uh, got rather excited uh, when, I, when I mentioned this study because I also wanted to look at the other dimension of um, this whole debate, and that is the social representations part. Why is it that some uh, people are, are experiencing this threat? Well, I wanted to interview their parents. So I interviewed with my research assistant some parents whose children had come out as, as gay to gauge their attitudes and their experiences. And they were also experiencing threat. But we tend not to think about the threat experienced by parents because they're also stigmatized as not being accepting of their children. If we really want to promote change, we've got to work with people who may express prejudice or discriminatory attitudes. We must not ostracize them. I believe that's the greatest mistake that we make is by ostracizing people with attitudes that are deemed to be unfavorable. We must work with them to support them, to sensitize them to the challenges. If we look at some of the extracts, um, we can see the threat in the first extract. I just thought I'd failed as a mother and failed in my duty as a good Muslim. That's when her son came out as gay. It had an impact on me. I felt disgusted with him, but also with myself. And I was alone in feeling this because I couldn't tell my husband anything or my children even. They too are experiencing threat. How can we support parents? I'll skip, I'll skip on, but as I said, you can look at the extracts later on, but it's exemplifying the threat and the coping, which may be to reject one's child. Coping behaviours, just to, to, to whiz through. Um, how do people react to this? What am I finding in my research? Well, there's a few things. One of the most famous social psychologists, Henri Tajfel, described the exit option. If you face threat, just leave the threatening group behind. If only it, that were, it, it were that easy. But it's hard for people whose religion is central to their identity to abandon that identity. It's hard for people who wish they were not gay to abandon that identity. The exit option is not always um, possible, and we can see that in this extract here. Being a Muslim is such an important part of my life, so if I had to choose between being gay and Muslim, I'd just be a Muslim and not gay. Often, I often question if I'm really gay or not. This may be one of the reasons why conversion therapy may be acceptable to some people who are experiencing threat, and may be endorsed and adopted by them, with often very powerfully traumatic effects for their well-being. I had to put this study in because it's one that's still not published and I, had, I, I learned a lot while studying it and that was a study of monkeypox. And so we were looking at how gay and bisexual men were coping with, with the new threat, the brand new threat of monkeypox, which is so recent, and how they were challenging the stigma, which was very reminiscent of the stigma observable in relation to HIV and subsequently COVID in relation to different groups. Well, what we found in this analysis of published men's accounts of their infection in news um, items was that gay and bisexual men took control of the narrative and they challenged challenge the stigmatizing representations that they faced. They, they emphasized their own lived experience to really um, outline their uh, response to this and they engaged in activism to challenge stigma. Now, remember I mentioned that an effective strategy is pressure groups. If you're facing threat and you mobilize as a group, you are more likely not only to, with, to, to counteract that threat, but you're also more likely to promote change that will mean others in your situation won't be threatened, and we've seen that in relation to so many groups. And just briefly, one of the, what we might call um, maladaptive, or, or in some cases negative strategies that some gay and bisexual men report engaging in is chemsex. That's 
uh, drug use in sexualized settings, so using substances and then engaging in um, sexual behaviors, which as you can imagine is in associated with a hepatitis C infection as well as um, HIV and um, a variety of mental health issues, the inability to operate um, in other spheres of one's life. It's more prevalent in, in gay men. I've heard some people say, well, actually, it's not just gay men. Lots of people take drugs and have sex, but actually, it's particularly prevalent in gay and bisexual men. So it is a challenge that we in the health community are, are cognizant of. And what our research in this area has clearly shown is that stresses can lead people to escape by engaging in drug use. The low self-esteem that some people face can lead them to do that. Now, that's not the case for everyone. There are some people who engage in this behavior transiently without impacts on other spheres of life. But we must acknowledge that there are some people who do face adversity. And we see some, I'll just read one extract, probably not the first one because it has a few expletives in it, but the second one. Um, doing chems for me, it's been an amazing experience, the ultimate high. You just lose all your barriers, all the things that hold you back and just let yourself go. I remember the first time was awkward at first, but someone gave me some G, that's a substance, and that was like, well, he let himself go, didn't he? He had, a, I think he had, a, he had a, a, a great time. That's basically what he's describing here and was able to disconnect from some of the trauma that people are reporting. To wrap up, this is my last slide, to wrap up, how, what do we do? A summary in just one slide, and I describe it in this book, which is called A Guide for Practitioners, and I was rather hoping that some of my physicians, physician colleagues would read it. They tell me that they have, but I, I, I'm rather inclined to test them on their knowledge and see whether, they, whether they're using this in the clinic or not, but it is a book that's written specifically for physicians, but also for others in, the, um, in, in sexual health care. Um, how do we facilitate coping? Well, I think we need to understand the whole identity of the individual, not just the category that's most immediately visible or accessible, the whole identity of the individual. The individual is not just gay. They may well be of a religious group. They may be an ethnic minority. They may be in an occupational setting where it's not really possible for them to share that identity. We need to, as I mentioned, create and um, ensure identity affirmative psychotherapeutic practice. I cannot count the number of times that um, people have said, I, I, I tried psychotherapy, it was a terrible experience, never do it again. We've lost an opportunity to intervene if, if we don't get it right the first time. We have a, a responsibility to do so. We need to support people to build identity resilience. Our interventions must build that in. And I think it can be done. I do it myself all the time. I'd like to write a book about that as well. You know, seven steps to identity resilience or something like that. H how do we facilitate outness and social support? Enabling people to be out and to secure support in some settings would enable us to prevent so much adversity. I had the privilege of being um, Wandsworth Council's, what was my title, Social, uh, Social Iso uh, Isolation Advisor. They wanted me to look at how we prevent loneliness because we know loneliness is associated with unnecessary trips to the doctor, for example, and a whole host of other things that lead to poor health outcomes. It's all about social support and it's all about being um, out and visible. You know, I'm not just talking about LGBTQ plus people. And the last one, we need to challenge all forms of stigma, prejudice and discrimination, even when it does not concern your own group. Because any context in which any form of discrimination is possible means that we permit that. Today it may be another group, tomorrow it may be your group. So we must always work together to call out discrimination. And I just want to end by saying, that's one of the reasons why it's a privilege to be um, here, part of the University of Brighton community, because that's what we do here. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Um, I, I don't know about you, but as a, as a gay woman who came out in the 80s, um, there was so much resonance in that for me terms of uh, the theory and, and, and I am uh, there is nothing as more as useful as a good theory so I, I feel a rush to the bookshelves for identity process theory I'm sure we'll all be there um, <laughs> Rishi that was fascinating it was for me um, a clear articulation of a, an, an e and the essence of intellectual inquiry into to a, a range of a topic which permeates us all in terms of identity, um, identity process theory. Um, your research makes a difference. Your research illustrates the extraordinary challenges that many of our um, 
fellow citizens face in a world where we all need to play our part to address discrimination because we are all agents of overcoming that and supporting that. So your work is, is meaningful. Um, it aids the practical wisdom that we all need to survive and thrive in society. So I'm hugely grateful that you're a member of the University of Brighton and that you reflect the values that we hold as an institution. Um, and I am just uh, so pleased to have been able to be here to listen to your fantastic lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry, colleagues, Professor Rizzi Justpau.